Welcome. I'm Sarah Barth, Executive Director of Semper Virens Fund. Thank you for joining us for another of our Under the Redwoods webinars, um, the series in which we explore the beauty, history, science, and benefits of redwood forests. Semper Virens Fund acknowledges that the redwood forests in the Santa Cruz Mountains, where we do our work, are among the ancestral lands for many indigenous peoples, people who cared for these lands for millennia until they were forcibly removed. We're grateful to work with their descendants, including the Amamutsan tribal band and the Muwekma Ohlone tribe to restore the cultural and traditional relationships to these magnificent forest lands. We are just coming off of Earth Day or Earth Month as some uh, call it. And the theme this year is Restore the Earth, which seems particularly meaningful in this region as we reflect on your steadfast support for our redwood forests that are recovering from wildfire. I know many of you have been on these webinars before and so you know how it works, but just a reminder that you can ask questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen um, and the chat and that we will get to as many of those questions as we can at the end of this webinar. In addition, we are recording this. So if you miss some of it or you'd like to share it with others, it will be recast on our website um, afterwards. Before we get into our talk for the day, I'm gonna give you a quick update on things going on at Semper Virens Fund. Um, the biggest activity and one that I am incredibly excited about is that tomorrow uh, we're making an important announcement that I get to instead share with you today, a bit of a preview before it goes to the public. And that is by the end of 2021, we will be removing a dam on Mill Creek in the San Vicente watershed. We've long sought, sought to restore this creek and some of the adjacent creeks uh, to improve uh, conditions, spawning habitat, uh, in particular for endangered coho salmon, steelhead trout, and all of the other aquatic species that occupy these streams. It's really important work. We're very excited about it. I'm especially grateful to our many partners who work with us on these efforts, including our friends at Peninsula Open Space Tr Trust and Save the Redwoods League, who help us in stewarding the San Vicente Redwoods, um, as well as our partners at the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, who are busy readying the San Vicente Redwoods for eventual public access. Our protection of redwood forests at San Vicente and really throughout the region is deeply rooted in our comprehensive effort to care for the land, restore the forests, restore the waterways so that they can be uh, hospitable to the native plants and animals that occupy these landscapes. So whether it's salmon, puma, California red-legged frogs, banana slugs or marbled muralets, your, your support for protecting these redwood forests means they are habitats that are healthier um, and more sustainable for a diverse array of wildlife species. To help us understand this intersection between redwoods and wildlife, we are really honored today and pleased to be joined by Portia Halbert. She's an environmental scientist with the Santa Cruz District of California State Parks. Portia has been involved in marbled muralette research for quite a long time. Some of you may already know these birds are really interesting, really mysterious. They spend most of their lives at sea, but they prefer to nest in the canopies of old growth trees, including coast redwoods. Unfortunately, a lot of their nesting habitat is in crisis right now. And in particular, there is concern that the fires that swept through this last summer and fall um, may have uh, really damaged important uh, muralet habitat and they are going to need to adapt and we in turn will need to adapt our management efforts to try to do what we can to support their survival. So I'm sure we'll hear more about that from Portia. Please join me in welcoming Portia Halber. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. I am... Um, I've been working for California State Parks for about 20 years, and all of my time has been here at the Santa Cruz District. And I got really early in, in on working with marble merlets early in my career. And it has been the focus of probably the last 15 years of my work. 
amongst many other things. And I just want to jump in and start my screen share here. Although I don't see the right screen. Let's try that one more time. There we go. So I want to spend the little bit of time that I have with you and give you a little bit of background about marbled merlet's natural history and some of the corvid management that's kind of the boots on the ground work that we do related to marbled merlet's. And I want to thank Semper Virens for asking me to come and, and share this with, uh, with you all. I begin with this beautiful photograph of marble merlets pointing. And you can all note the background here is the iconic Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. And I, I want to start with that because it does help show how close they are and that connection that you all, many of you who may have been to the boardwalk or live in the Santa Cruz area that you have to these animals. So my story begins in the winter of 1974 and we had a, a snowstorm in the Santa Cruz mountains. Our trees aren't accustomed to the weight of the snow. As you all know, it's unusual for us to, to get much snow here. And we had a lot of broken branches in our, um, in our trees. So they were a safety hazard and they closed several campgrounds, a big basin, until the trees could be examined. And in the summer of 1974, Hoyt Foster, uh, a tree surgeon as he liked to call himself, was climbing one of these uh, damaged trees. And you know, having spent his career doing tree work, he had came upon something he had never seen before. It was this little fluff ball is how he described it. And he poked it and he prodded it with his hands off gently and it fought back. It backed up a little bit and as it did, he noticed it had webbed feet. So what does that mean to you all? If you know of an animal with webbed feet, that means they're a water bird. So he's scratching his head and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't understand. So he decides uh, well, he has to cut this limb which had been damaged. And, uh, and so he was going to collect this bird. So he puts his jacket over it and the bird didn't like that. And it backed out from underneath him and it fell all the way to the ground, about 140 feet, hitting a few branches along the way. One of his helpers collected it from the ground. It was unhurt and they took it into the, the office there at Big Basin and they were gonna take it to Native Animal Rescue. Nobody knew what it was. And it just so happened that day that a ranger, Denzel Verardo, who was coming in to check his mail on his day off, he peeked into the box and realized that this was the answer to a long mystery about this bird. This was the marbled merlet. And this was the very first nest that had ever been discovered. Very cool. Uh, this is a very exciting thing. Uh, and I should also mention that it is the last bird in North America whose nesting lo location was discovered. And I should also, you know, give, uh, give credit to the Native Americans who lived in this area when the early uh, biologists were asking questions about this bird and where they nested. The Native Americans told the uh, the researchers that they, they nested high up in the hills. And I uh, just want to acknowledge that, uh, that, that wisdom. So this bird uh, is the, the chick of a marbled merlet. And the color, we call this color dappled shade. You can see it's very splotchy and tan and it's very a soft downy and it really does camouflage or blend into the background of the forest. And here we have our adult marble burlets in their summer plumage. And they get their name from their plumage, which in this case is kind of a marbled brown, also perfect camouflage for them. And uh, here's another shot of marble burlet just taken off of the water. Again, you can note this marbled brown. And you might ask what they eat. Uh, 
uh, that's the parent and it sits still there for a while until the chick grabs it and shockingly takes it down whole. So very cool. Uh, so they eat fish and uh, you can see, of course, they have that webbed feet. Here's a, a diving marble merlet. And here is their wintertime plumage. Uh, they are light below and dark above. Again, is camouflage for being out on the water. Um, the darkness comes down just below their eye. And uh, they're, they're smallish. They're the size of a robin. You guys are all familiar with seeing robins on a regular basis. They could fit in your hand. They're seven to nine inches long, um, about the size of a baked potato. And here's that progression of plumage color change that you can see in the winter as they uh, molt and take on their summertime plumage. This is uh, a photo from the Cal Academy of Sciences and their uh, collection of marbled merlets. In addition to eating uh, lots of small fish, they will also eat krill and crustaceans. We've been uh, helping to fund some interesting research that Zach Peary and Richard Golightly are doing, trying to determine exactly what it is they eat. Because in a way, you know, it, it's a little bit shocking that we don't know more about what they eat. But we do know that they eat these small fish and they eat things like crustacean and krill. So where are they located? Where do you find them? They're found from Point Conception all the way up through Alaska. You can make out the, the different colors. Uh, they're found usually within a kilometer and a half of the shore, often much closer. And we in the Santa Cruz Mountains are at the southern end of their breeding distribution. So they are found further south. They're found out as far as you know, uh, Cambria, but they're uh, not documented to nest there anymore. Historically, they would have, but not anymore. And they are known to fly up to 62 miles inland in the Washington area. Uh, they bring their chick multiple feedings uh, while they are uh, taking care of it. And so that uh, it's up to eight times per day they can be making that round trip. So pretty amazing athletes. And what is this connection with, with redwoods? Well, in California, at least, uh, they are uh, they're closely connected, but of course they nest in different things like spruce and hemlock as you move up through Oregon, Washington, Alaska. But here you can see these beautiful old trees and I should show you this next slide. So you can make out these wonderfully wide branches, this uh, complexity that you see in old growth redwoods with broken tops and cavities. That is all very important for marbled merlets because it turns out they don't actually make a nest. They require the wide branches and platforms that exist in old growth forests in order to lay their egg. So you can see here that this egg is just uh, placed in a depression, often maybe with uh, duff and leaf litter, uh, and the merlets will just nestle down into that and, and lay their egg. They don't do any building. And these kinds of platforms, of course, are only found in old growth forests. Here's another example of this. And wonderfully, this egg, for a, for a bird so small, this egg is the size of a chicken egg. And what that tells you is that it takes a lot of energy for merlets to, to make this egg, and they only lay one egg. Uh, if something happens to that egg, then they will um, they will likely not nest again, although there's been some recent accounts of that happening. But in general, it's thought that uh, it's, it's sort of a one and done. Here is a nest after a chick has uh, hopefully fledged from it. You can make out that it is where the branch connects to the tree and it's very, again, it's very wide flat stable platform and it's supported by all of these uh, these mosses and ferns. That white ring is the fecal ring and you can see uh, adults generally kind of shoot their poop off of the 
uh, the nest, but the chicks uh, at the end, uh, they have left a nice uh, little white ring. Here's another uh, a marble merlet adult on uh, a very wide, funky branch. And again, another shot. So why merlets and why redwoods? Well, I'm here talking to you about them, most likely because there aren't that many of these old growth uh, forests left. This is the historic or original extent of old growth redwood forest throughout California. And uh, it's this green schmear that you can see along the, the coast. And what it looks like now is much diminished. You can make out the green there. And now I've, uh, I've overlaid the two together. And now you can see uh, compared to what originally was here, we have lost about 95% of old growth forests in uh, not just California, but my understanding is uh, North America. We lost most of it to, to logging. A lot of the Santa Cruz Mountains was surely on tap to be logged, but of course it's the process of the uh, the burning down of San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake led to uh, even um, rap more rapid cutting of trees. This is uh, from the Santa Cruz coast area. You can see this is uh, shortly after it, it had been all logged. Uh, other impacts currently to the marble merlet are impacts directly from fishing activities, right? So long line fishing uh, that causes direct harm to the birds, but also can um, can act as competition, you know, for those uh, scarce foodstuffs. And I've been primarily funded uh, through oil spills. So we've had quite a few different oil spills in the area that have impacted marbled merlets. And this is the command oil spill where a, a ship was caught intentionally discharging oil. And the gray line there in the, in the middle along the coast from north of Half Moon Bay, uh, all the way down uh, towards Año Nuevo. Oil came up upon shore, so that's where it was deposited. The, the Lukenbach oil spill was a, a ship that was intentionally sunk there where the plus mark is. And uh, it, during big storms, uh, it would burp up oil that was still left inside of it. And for years, it was distributed up and down the, the coast there from all the way from Monterey to Point Reyes. And they finally figured out that it was, um, it was this ship that was causing the problem and they eventually sealed it, but we got funding from it. And then finally, probably several of you uh, remember this, uh, what this plus again, the red plus mark is where the Co um, Costco Busan uh, container ship hit the Bay Bridge. And because of the tidal action in the San Francisco Bay brought that oil all the way out to the coast and distributed it well, with, um, well within the San Francisco Bay. So what does that mean? All of those oil spills, uh, they generated civil settlements. Uh, they, it was estimated that 52,000 birds were killed as a result of this, not marbled merlets, but birds in general. And uh, the result was $26 million uh, in fines were budgeted for restoration. And that largely went to, to fund my position over the last uh, 15 years or so. All right, so now as a land manager, I'm thinking about how I can address uh, any sort of restoration type activities related to marble merlets. And one of the things that we know from some of the limited research that's been done is that our known nests are near recreation areas. They're within our parks and they're often in the heart of our parks, the, the places with those, the biggest, best old growth trees that we all love to go visit. And you can make those out with the, the red dots on this slide. And as we've been monitoring marble merlets for the last uh, 20, 30 years, we have uh, seen this somewhat alarming trend of decreasing numbers. And so uh, these average occupied behaviors that we had in the early 1990s, those were counts of marble merlets that had flown 
beneath the height of the tallest tree in the forest. And that was between 60 and 80 in the, in the early 90s. And now sometimes we don't get any, sometimes we only get a couple. Uh, and so, well, I got this slide in uh, 2002 and I've just been doing this because there's, uh, the line extends for the last nearly 20 years as, at very, very low numbers. Now, while these marble merlet numbers have been going down, we also have raven numbers that have been increasing. This is for uh, from Christmas bird count data over the last uh, 70 years or so. They have been uh, counting birds as uh, a consistent count. And what we know is that until the early 1980s, ravens were very rare, very un unusual to see them here. And we have seen that number increase. And I think that a lot of you, if you think about the amount, the numbers of ravens and even crows that you've seen around uh, locally, that that number has gone way up. Now, in addition to the ravens, we have stellar J numbers that we discovered were up to nine times higher within the campground than they were within the control area. So this is where we have begun to focus our efforts in terms of uh, corvids. Corvids are this class of birds, including Stellar's jays and ravens, that um, turns out have a really marked impact on marble merlets as predators. They are known for being very intelligent. And as we started monitoring marbled merlet nests, it turns out that most of them were being predated by jays and ravens. I have a couple little uh, videos to show you here. Again, um, this is a video of a marbled merlet sitting on a uh, nest, you can see the egg there. And uh, this was just a camera running all of the time on this particular nest as they were monitoring it. And here you see uh, a Stellar's J come in from the outside. Portia, we are not seeing these videos. N neither one of the videos you saw? No. Okay, the first one as well you didn't see? Correct, so maybe we can um post them on our website afterwards. Okay, I can also um, uh, share the screen just really briefly as well. Uh, this is the video that I'd like you guys to see. Again, a marble merlet sitting on her nest or its nest. Now we see it, thank you. Yes, we'll just have to. Uh, so what we know is that Merlets have been predated both chicks and eggs by stellar jays. So the parent is flushed off of the nest, and now you can see uh, the jay is, is eating the contents of the egg, and it's joined by its partner here. Might have been better if we hadn't seen it. <laughs> Poor. It is, uh, I, I'll, I have another one that I'm, I'll just avoid showing you. <laughs> Let's see, I believe it's this. All right, are we back? Can you see it again? We see the video, but it's not moving. That's great. That's part of the, the presentation. It was just a screenshot. Hmm. Let me try that one more time. I apologize, it appears my screen wanted to freeze. Give me just a moment. All right, so we know that marbled merlets are being heavily predated by corvids. And we, you know, with this being such a secretive bird, we don't know a ton about uh, 
you know, what we can do to help them. But we do know that we, Parks, is, um, you know, just by virtue of bringing people into the park and having them have their picnics and whatnot, we are supporting an increase, uh, an increased population of these predatory birds. And we know that that's having a direct impact on marbled merlets. Just a moment, I'm going back to my talk to open it again, see if we can get it to catch up with us. So over the last um, 10 years specifically, we have been really ramping up our efforts in uh, garbage control programs. When I first arrived at state parks, they, we, didn't, we did not have any uh, animal proof trash cans, just as simple as that. And so as part of this funding from these different oil spill programs, uh, we have begun, uh, we have replaced all of our, uh, our trash cans so that they're animal proof. And in some cases they're actually bear proof. The, um, the way that, uh, you know, people would store their food when they would come to the campground is it often be in a cooler and coolers can get broken into by, um, by raccoons and then the trash is spread around and then picked up by, by ravens and jays and that sort of thing. So are you able to see my screen again? We are, thanks. Yeah, so you know, we went from having these round metal trash cans to now uh, fully um, animal proof uh, trash cans as well as uh, giving people a place to put their food once they're in the campground. So these, uh, these large metal food lockers that again are, are bear proof. So I like to joke that we're, we're ready for bears if they do ever decide to move back into the area. We have been doing targeted raven removals. Uh, we have a contract with US Department of Agriculture to do that. So we are acting as a sink. We have generally ravens come in and uh, don't last very long. And then the probably the biggest thing that I've been working on is different forms of interpretation and education, how we can encourage the public to do the right thing by way of this bird. And we came up with a lot of different ways to do that. And uh, I really like this feed a jay, kill a merlet. But in reality, we learned through some different studies that this was perhaps the best way to do it, which is to keep it crumb clean. You get right to the message of what you want people to do. So I'm guessing quite a few of you have seen this interpretive program that I'm really quite proud of that has been adopted at parks around the state in Oregon and Washington even. So this is the sign that is on the food locker that gets right to the point. And kind of down here at the bottom, we tell them you know, why, but really we, we just want you to keep it crumb clean. We also created a signage for people who didn't know how to wash their, their dishes when they go camping. We get a lot of novice campers that have never been camping before. So we do need to be proactive in terms of how we educate the folks. And I want to just mention that, you know, we have come a long way in terms of thinking about how to manage wildlife. This is a photograph from the, the 50s from uh, Yosemite. And you know it was a pretty standard practice to, to go watch the bears be fed um, when they dumped the trash off, right? So this is something that we, uh, we're slowly adopting, we're getting better at it. And I have to tell you that there have been uh, several publications recently that have, um, that have said and shown that we, we were actually accomplishing what we were trying to accomplish in terms of direct management for the marbled merlets based on their predators, right? Their predator numbers being less than they used to be by, by a lot. Um, my screen seems to have frozen again. All right, so I, I have a few slides where I like to show folks where marble merlet numbers are located. Oh, did it come back up again? Can you guys see it? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, I'm going to try one more time. So you got, most of you are familiar with uh, the Santa Cruz-San Mateo coastline. 
And these, uh, all the little dots that you see off the coast are locations where we saw merlets. This was from a 2015 year. And those bright pink dots are where we, where we had seen juveniles. And we do uh, studies uh, both in the forest and at sea in order to monitor their population. This is uh, what their, their population looks like right now. So we're at about 400 birds is the estimate for the number of merlets as of last summer, summer 2020. And of course, uh, that was prior to the fire and we'll discuss some of that in the discussion. But uh, I want to leave you with this, this idea of a marbled merlet chick. And you've all seen young chicks who are learning how to fly, right? So imagine you are uh, a marble merlet chick and you've been on the nest for 30 days or so and your parents every day bring you food. And one day uh, they decide they don't, well, they don't, they don't come anymore. And this is your biological signal or your trigger that it's time and it's time to fledge. So the marble merlet chick, it begins to pull off all of that down and that fuzzy, that dappled shade colored fuzz. And uh, people who have described it describe a rain of, of feathers coming down, floating down through the forest. And at dusk, uh, the marble merlet chick who's never flown before and is a hundred or hundreds of feet up in the air on a branch, on a tree, miles from the ocean, and this chick now, once the sun goes down, it jumps and it flies all the way to the ocean. And occasionally they don't quite make it. And we have had reports over the last you know, 50, 60 years of marbled merlet chicks being found on the forest floor. And here you can make out uh, a young marbled merlet chick with uh, that white spot on the end of its bill is, is the egg tooth. You can even make out some of that down that it wasn't able to get off behind its eyes and on its neck. And so we actually created some interpretive materials. We want people to collect these birds and bring them to us. Their numbers are so low that every one counts. So unlike many of the other um, you know, animals that we tell people to just leave them alone, this is one that we would want people to bring into us. And we've been successful at uh, putting them out on the ocean after people, after the park visitors have found them and brought them to us. So that's the, that's my talk for you all. I hope you learned a little something about marbled merlets and I'm happy to take some, uh, some questions maybe. So I'm curious, I want to jump off with a question about what you think the fires may have meant uh, for these birds. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, in that case, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. I, I did uh, include a couple of uh, slides to show you about uh, what this looks like for us. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. So the bright pink outline is the limit of the CZU lightning complex fire. And you can see that it encompasses uh, well, about 86,000 acres, but really the heart of Big Basin, uh, where we had more than 10,000 acres of old growth. Uh, it also includes uh, Butno and some of the uh, Pescadero uh, County parks. It went right up to Portola, but uh, we, after doing some estimating with my colleague, Steve Singer, uh, it appears that we have, um, we have lost about uh, 60 to 70 percent of the old growth habitat. And when I say lost, I do say it with a, uh, a caveat, which means, um, you know, merlets need several things, right? Because they are such secretive birds, they need those wide platforms, but they also need to have some sort of cover over it. They need the branches and the needles and the, uh, the greenery to act as, as protection for them. So because the, at least the redwoods, most of the redwoods probably aren't dead. Uh, we are seeing all kinds of regrowth and re-sprouting, but I believe that we have lost for the short term, uh, 
the majority of marble merlet habitat in the Santa Cruz Mountains. So uh, what, what does that mean? Um, there's a couple things that we're thinking about. One is that uh, some, some areas that we were, we never had documented evidence of marble merlet use, but appeared to be good habitat. We think that some of those areas will get birds that are nesting in them. Um, but we don't know unless we monitor it. So I have these audio recording units. They're, um, you know, they're little boxes and they've got some pretty uh, magical microphones on them. And they're programmed to record it uh, around dawn. That's when we do our forest surveys. Uh, they are very, marble merlets are active at that time of day. You can predictably see them and hear them 45 minutes before sunrise to about an hour uh, and 15 minutes or so after sunrise. Uh, it's kind of a, a fun thing, but the recording units will, um, will record and then we send that information into uh, a lab with conservation metrics they're a local company and and they do some fancy computer stuff and are able to tell us how much noise marble burnlets are making in the forest so we're going to be putting those out in places where it did burn to see if we can document any kind of reuse at all, or we'll also be putting them out in different places that have never had use or had limited use or different kinds of use to see what happens. What happens now that we have had so much fire through this area? So unlike say a salmon, which returns to its natal stream or other species that will only nest in one location, you think there's some optimism that they may be able to find alternative nesting sites? I do. I suffer. I suffer from optimism sometimes. I'm. I'm very hopeful that they will begin. Will, will begin to nest in in new places, and that they will continue to nest in places like, uh, like the a large portion of Butno Redwood State Park was not. Um, uh, burned very intensely. Uh, it had, I would say we had excellent fire effects and uh, the fire just burned the understory and didn't move through the, um, move through and scorch large portions of the, the upper canopy. So I, I'm hopeful that there will be, there will continue to be nesting and that there will be some rearranging of where they nest. Uh, you know, we have always said that marble merlets are you know, exhibit site fidelity, which means they like the places they like, and they will continually go back and re-nest in, um, in the same places. There's documented um, the same merlet pair was nesting in the father of the forest a couple of times, and in different locations we have documented that, so that's what we, one of the reasons we say that they like to go back to where, you know, they had nested before, like a salmon, but um, it's, it's different now that the forest, I don't think is going to be able to support it for some time until all of uh, these redwoods rebuild their, their, uh, their needles. And on that note, um, I haven't really mentioned Douglas firs as part of this, but Douglas firs are a very important part or component of nesting habitat for marbled merlets. Uh, unlike redwoods, Douglas firs develop those larger branches much more quickly than redwoods. You know, a 250 year old Douglas fir will have really big branches, whereas a, you know, a thousand year old redwood may have branches that are equivalent. So unfortunately, after the Lockheed fire, uh, Steve Otten, a local forester, uh, did some research on the impact of that fire on Douglas firs, and it turns out that uh, if there is a large portion of the canopy of a dug fir that is scorched, that that tree is likely to die. Um, so we, we've lost, it appears that we have lost a large uh, proportion of the Douglas firs across the Santa Cruz mountains in the burn area. I'm looking for silver linings here. I'm wondering if, um... Perhaps the fact that a number of these same parks are closed to the public and will be for a while may mean, is it possible that that means there will be fewer corvids, um, fewer disturbance for the birds that do return? 
Yeah, um, that's kind of a tough one because even so, there's not any cover. There's wow. just a bunch of brown leaves and needles and that sort of thing. So I, I, I struggle with that one as well. Um, again, my bright side is that they might begin to use some of these areas they hadn't been used for a long time and we don't know why, right? So um, Semper Virens owns a number of properties that are either documented um, muralette habitat where mm -hmm. our folks will go out and put out acoustic monitors or go get up at five in the morning and watch them fly over, which I always feel really proud that we're able to be a, provide a home for these really rare birds. Um, and we have a lot of habitat, a lot of forest land that we own that I think could be, that is, seems like it should be hospitable, um, but we haven't documented them there. What is what is the role of groups like Semper Virens and other land trusts in trying to help with these recovery efforts, which seem even more dire now? Well, I wanna thank you for all of the support that you've already given us. I mean, uh, for, for the audience who may not know this, we have um, been working with Semper Virens, well, our relationship is really, you know, very much embedded uh, with one another. And we have been receiving funding from you to help with all of the different uh, fuel reduction work and some of the, a lot of the cleanup efforts. And so that has, uh, that funding's gone right to supporting the different pieces related to, you know, fixing up this fire. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, what else you can, what else you can do, I mean, I would say just continue to, to, to work with us to support the different needs that we have because as a state organization, we have some restrictions that we're not always able to do what we like as easily as we'd like. So uh, I would say, yeah, supporting us, continuing to support the, the private research that I know that you do. And then also, you know, those pieces on the edge, you know, continuing to acquire and conserve pieces on the edge. Yeah, I mean, we have an approach at Semper Virens in which we um, we really highly prize protection of remaining old growth trees, even individual trees, because they are so important to the health of the forest writ large. But mm -hmm. this really is just additional motivation for us because of how essential they are to the muralettes. Um, well, one thing that you can't do as a state employee, a state park employee, but that I can do as a uh, person affiliated with a nonprofit organization is we can advocate for funding and for protective uh, policies that leave these forests intact that limit oil and gas development and mm -hmm. some of the accompanying destruction that wreaks. Um, one of the things we were really pleased to see recently was that Governor Newsom uh, put forth an announcement of half a billion dollars to go to wildfire recovery efforts and wildfire prevention efforts. Um, for years, California has poured gazillions of dollars into fighting fires after they started, but we haven't as a state or really as a country been that as good as we should be about investing in the kinds of efforts needed to reduce the likelihood of catastrophic wildfires. So I'm just curious for you and your muralette work, how are you feeling about that? How does that half a billion dollars translate down into efforts to protect these yeah. cute little birds? Uh, let, let me just start by saying that that funding is such a game changer for us that we have not had that influx of any, of any sort like that to support our programs related to fire recovery. So the governor's program is, is pretty cool. Uh, it's, we're looking at about $75 million coming just to state parks, not, not just in this area, but statewide. And we're looking at um, an additional $5 million a year from CAL FIRE funding. And then there's this AB 3407, something like that, that has looks like it's about to be a, a approved that will be uh, about $2 million for state parks as a whole to continue with fire um, recovery efforts, or I should say specifically related to doing building um, structure hardening and uh, perimeter, you know, working on 
uh, sorry, I'm losing the words for it right now, but our defensible space around our structures and around the communities that surround us. So uh, what, what that's gonna mean is an increase in the amount of fuel reduction that's done throughout our parks, uh, hopefully a massive increase in pace and scale in doing prescribed fire. So all of that fuel reduction, we'd like to tie that into creating actual burn plots. So I like to recommend or suggest that, that you all listening have the ability to advocate for that kind of work. And that includes uh, talking to your friends and family and uh, letting them know how important it is to do things like fuel reduction and uh, implement and put on prescribed fires. And sometimes that comes at the cost of breathing smoke for a couple of days. And all of that uh, will help protect the, the remaining bits of really intact habitat. So. Great. We're, we're really excited about implementing all of these different forestry and uh, wildfire resiliency efforts. I mean, it's, it's gonna be a, a massive effort and we're looking, yeah, looking forward to getting a lot done. Well, let's hope it's an initial down payment on, you know, a century's worth of work that needs to be, uh, well, to make up for a century of fire suppression. Um, so Portia, I'm gonna ask you to, um, stop sharing your screen so the audience can see your face. And I've got one quick last question and then we'll open it up to those that have been submitted to us. We talked a lot about fire, but those of us who live in California are hearing a lot about drought right now. And I just wondered if you have a sense for whether drought will impact these birds. Do we even know? We, we don't really know. Um, like so many things, we will learn a lot from this fire about the impact of drought. I am thinking about beetles right now and how when, when trees are stressed, they release pheromones that attract beetles in. And as the, as the weather is warming up, even now you can go out into the burn areas and as it's you know, getting warm in the 1, 2 p.m. time frame, you can hear the beetles in the forest. And so, you know, we're looking at, you know, the impact of the fire, the stressed out trees, you add a drought to that, and those trees that might have made it if we'd have had a bigger winter uh, might succumb to uh, beetle damage as a result of the fire um, and, you know, exacerbated by the, the lack of water. So, yeah. uh, it's a tough moment. Yeah. It's a tough moment for the forests of this region and yeah, the people. It really is. Well, uh, on that note, I'm going to open it up to my colleague, Matt, who's been monitoring the chat, and he's going to ask you um, some questions from, coming from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Portia. Great job. And uh, you've inspired a lot of interest and a lot of questions. Um, folks want to help solve some problems too. We have a lot of questions about whether it's possible to create um, artificial nest substitutes, replicate the nest, create building ledges, et cetera. If you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, what I can share is that it's been something that gets proposed occasionally as we, you know, us Merlet folks get together and brainstorm ways that we can uh, help restore what not for the birds. And I, I think that the problem is that they're so uh, secretive and they're so seemingly selective that it doesn't appear that nets platforms would be an option. So uh, if you think about what it would take to put them throughout the forest and uh, have them actually use them, uh, th there has been no uh, attempt to do so, but I think that just even the thought of climbing these trees, I did look at the option to climb and it was uh, to do some, something else is another part of another study. Uh, we were looking at about $500 a climb and you would need to put many, many, many of these platforms out. And again, there's no evidence that they would actually then use them. So yeah, it does get suggested, but nobody's put forth the energy or effort to try it. I think most of us are pretty skeptical that it would actually work. Interesting, thank you. Um, uh, what about captive breeding programs? And maybe that's been suggested as well. Yeah, uh, no one's ever tried it for, for marbled merlets. Um, 
there have been several um, times where they've tried to, to keep them in captivity and they don't live, but uh, no actual breeding efforts that I'm aware of. Okay, thanks. Um, also wondering uh, if you could say a little bit about some of, some of their, their basic behaviors. How, how, many, how long do they live and how many eggs do they lay in their lifetime? Hmm. Oh, that's, those are great. I've never been asked that question before. So we're thinking uh, about 20 years, 20 in the early 20 years they live. And then um, as far as eggs, it appears that they can be successful breeders the following year. So when they're one year old. So if they lay one egg a year, then it would be, um, you know, maybe, maybe 19 to 25 eggs. And if they are one of the ones that has to re-leg, you know, maybe add another half dozen onto that or so. So maybe they can lay, uh, well, the females at least can lay uh, about 25 eggs in a lifetime would be, and I've never thought I had to work my way through that just now. So uh, that's my best guess for that. Excellent, thank you. Um, do mating pairs always return to the same nest sites or does it vary from year to year? We have, um, we don't know, first of all, there have been um, a couple times where they've put on radio transmitters, like a little, they pull off some feathers and they glue a radio transmitter to the back of a, a merlet. And they did that and they found uh, about 20 different nests. And unfortunately, the result of them putting on those, um, those radio transmitters are that we ended up losing almost all of those birds. So the thought is that there's something about the way uh, that it impacted their behavior or flight pattern that caused them to die. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that we were trying to learn about um, you know, how they nest, but in this one year of trying that, we lost the majority of them. And so it, what, it hasn't been approved since then. So we have limited information about uh, specifics. You know, we don't have a lot of uh, detail on this individual or this particular pair. Uh, there are a few accounts of them re-nesting, ones that uh, they were able to determine they were the same ones based on facial markings and you know, spotting them from the ground. But um, yeah, it's, a, it's still a whole lot of we don't know. They truly are a mystery. That is yeah. fascinating. Um, here, here's a question. Um, one of our guests was out at Monterey Bay and heard merlets calling to their chicks and was wondering how do they find each other out on the water after the chick has fledged the nest? We don't know that they do. <laughs> I was expecting that might be the case. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> wouldn't, it be, uh, wouldn't it be nice if there was a way for us to figure that? I'm happy to hear whatever uh, the public has to share with me, but I'm, I'm, I'd be curious about a way that we could determine that, but no, we don't. Um, I wonder you know, if people, go ahead. No, please go ahead. Uh, I just realized that I didn't describe their, their sound. And I, I should mention that they sound like, uh, I think they sound like a seagull. Like when I listen to them and I close my eyes, I picture being at the beach. They make a keer, keer, keer sound. I'm gonna play it real quick for you here. So yeah, if you close your eyes, it does sound as if you could be at the beach. So if, um, if they were hearing them, if someone was hearing them out on the ocean, they might be calling to each other. They're often seen in, in pairs in small groupings and, uh, and they do talk to each other. So they will be making the similar cure sounds as they're flying and as they're sometimes sitting on the water. Um, I have a couple questions here about their, where they live and where they might be faring. Um, uh, you, you showed a map that showed you know, a lot of Pacific seaboard locations. Is that it for the world? Or do we, do, do we know about them uh, living elsewhere? And do we know if they're faring better elsewhere um, since the fires? The thought is that they are regionally located. So that our birds in the Santa Cruz Mountains live here in the Santa Cruz Mountains and that they might go say up to Point Reyes or down to Big Sur to forage or during the non-breeding time of the year, but uh, that it's thought that they live here and will preferably breed here as well. 
there are multiple species of merlets. There's the Xantu's merlet, there's the Scripps merlet, there's the um, Kitlitz merlet, the, the, they nest on, on glaciers. <laughs> and um, so, you know, different species are, you know, doing a little bit differently, but uh, the marbled merlet here in California is endangered and endangered is a technical definite, uh, the definition is that it means it's likely to go extinct. Um, the marbled merlet in Washington and Oregon is just threatened, so in danger of becoming endangered. And then uh, in Alaska, they're doing just fine. So they are, I, I should say, I have spent time on Prince William Sound in Alaska, and I saw an amazing number of marbled merlets. It was really kind of special and mind blowing for me to see how many there were still doing really well. That's really interesting. So they're, because they're regionally located, each, each area has its own sort of designation. That's right. And we are in uh, what is called zone six. People were interested in it. And it is, uh, is again, the Southern end of their distribution. Are those different subspecies, Portia? In Alaska, is it the same species? It or is the different? same species, yeah. So maybe we could see if things really continue to go downhill here, some eventual reintroduction redistribution. Yeah, that would be an interesting thing. You know, one of the things we've learned about a lot of other animals is you try and move them around that often in the process of relocating, they they don't fare very well. You know, they're already sort of maybe pushed to the edge of their habitat. This happens with, with pumas, as you probably know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I love the idea. And I, it does make me hopeful that well, we could maybe get some back here, but yeah, nobody's ever tried that before to my knowledge. Well, I'm just thinking there's been some phenomenal news recently about uh, California condor, which of course, 20, 30 years ago, the last remaining ones were pulled out of the wild, captive breeding program, and then successfully reintroduced to various parts of California and are now reappearing in uh, our region and up north in Redwood Forest, where they haven't been seen for decades. Um, so I don't want to be Pollyannish and I realize it's completely different species, different challenges, but um, otherwise I'm going to spend uh, my nights fretting and dreaming about endangered murelets. So I'm, yeah. I'm looking for something that gives me hope we can help the species persist. But it sounds yeah. like outside of our region, the, the species is not in danger of complete extinction. It's, it's a local extirpation that we're, that yeah. we're we run the risk. That's correct. And, uh, you know, we are in this, uh, we have this big buffer above us where Mendocino hardly, Marin and Mendocino hardly have any marbled merlets at all because the, the logging was so complete in that area. Wow. So, um, you know, we are really this little isolated population that is genetically uh, somewhat distinct from the other populations further north. Yeah, well, that's a nice segue. Um, thank you, Portia. This was so interesting and um, concerning, but it also interesting and good for people to know and for us to understand and just emphasizes again the importance of those old growth forests to species like this. Um, but it's a good segue into me introducing our next uh, webinar series. Um, I want to thank everybody who joined us today and encourage people to join us next month when we will have with us, uh, speaking about pumas, Dr. Chris Wilmers from UC Santa Cruz, who heads the Santa Cruz Puma Project and with whom Semper Virens works extremely closely. We have a lot of puma on our properties. Um, however, like the murelet, the Central Coast population of pumas is uh, was just recognized as being um, imperiled by the state and received a, a formal designation as such. So um, join us next month for a discussion about pumas and great thanks to Portia and to all of you for joining us and for supporting um, Redwood's uh, conservation and restoration efforts. Thank you. Thank you.